Hello, this is Kate O'Hanlon with the Laparoscopic Institute for Gynecologic Oncology talking about total laparoscopic hysterectomy. Indications are early ovarian, uterine, and cervical cancer, pelvic mass, large fibroids, prolapse, stress incontinence, and this procedure is available to nulligravid women, senior women, and the very obese. The women we don't do it on are those with pre -op previous operative reports documenting severe adhesions, masses too big to remove intact, and severe metastatic disease. Here we're starting to perform a total laparoscopic hysterectomy. We have access via four ports, an intra-umbilical port, two lateral ports that are placed just medial to the anterior superior iliac crest, and one suprapubic port. We're visualizing the ureter as it crosses over the deep uh, pelvic tissues at the common iliac artery. Now we're using the ligature device, a bipolar instrument, to coagulate the ovarian arteries. We apply two coagulation treatments and then cut in the middle simply to be safe, although this is not necessary in smaller uteruses. Typically, we will be able to incise through the infundibulopelvic ligament. Uh, there is a humi uterine manipulator inside the uterus. I don't use any of the very large uh, and bungle some uh, culpotomizer devices. I use a $3 Kroner uterine manipulator and then after the uterus is removed we simply obturate the vagina with a glove containing two 4x4s. Now we replicate open hysterectomy standards so here as soon as the round ligament has been ligated we push the uterus up. You just saw that happen. We push the uterus up and keep it on tense traction counter traction replicating open standards. So with my suprapubic hand, um, I will lift up the bladder flap and I will deflect the uterus. And with my uh, right hand, I'm standing on the patient's right side, I'll begin to incise the bladder flap. So I'll lift up the bladder flap and I will push very roughly, feeling the cervical vaginal margin. You can feel it as clear as you can feel your olecranon process. That's your elbow. So I incise across the uterus, again, feeling the anterior aspect of the cervical vaginal margin, pushing now to delineate the uterine artery. And now I am delivering to my ligature device, the uterine artery, not completely, however, maintaining upward cephalad traction, counter traction. Now I'm applying multiple applications of the bipolar energy to the uterine artery. The reason for this is when the tissue is under such extreme traction as we keep it for this part of the procedure, the ligature device which co-apts the tissue and makes a coagulum of uncharred tissue cannot be as easily relied on in one application. So we use multiple applications here. You can see we're applying this exactly where we would apply the Haney clamps if this were an open procedure. Small amount of bleeding ensues from back bleeding and so I just simply advance the ligature to treat that area. And we have nice hemostasis as we have just begun to work our way through the uterine artery. So I'll give a little extra treatment to the anti-grade vessels and then I'm just going to go right in the crotch, if you will, of where I have treated before. Finally now to coagulate and then to cut and I'm working my way across the anterior aspect of the cervix. So again, I'll lift up the bladder flap, push the bladder away from the uterus exposing the glistening white anterior cervical fascia. With the uterus still on tense traction, counter traction upwardly, we identify the uterine artery pedicle and then go posteriorly 
to coagulate and then incise across the uterosacral ligament. And this is done in a few small steps very carefully. But what you can see now just above there are the fibers of the cardinal ligament. Those are the fibers that belong that exist between the uterine artery and the cervical cylinder. So here you can see I am going medial to the uterine artery and incising those fibers just medial to the uterine artery which you can see it's starting to it's trying to open up a little bit there so I'll give it a little treatment in a little bit but here I am simply incising across the uterine I'm sorry the uh, cardinal ligaments because these are on such tense traction counter traction you may have to retreat a little bit so here we are working our way across now at the precise cervicovaginal junction. We're incising the pubocervical fascia and palpating posteriorly to confirm the cervicovaginal margin as well as palpating the cervix itself. Now how do we know we're at the cervicovaginal margin? Three ways. We look and feel anteriorly. We look and feel posteriorly. And if we can't determine where it is, we'll put a one inch ribbon into the anterior vagina and cut right to it. So now we'll continue with the hysterectomy and we will uh, begin to work on the other side. Lifting the left fallopian tube and ovary and coagulating immediately adjacent to the ovary. Sometimes it's necessary to remove those congenital adhesions between the bowel, which you see here, and the lateral pelvic sidewall. We're not doing it in this case because it doesn't seem to be essential to the case. Again, you can see we're applying multiple treatments only because we have the tissue on, treat on uh, tension but once we have created a nice coagulum we cut through and work our way along the broad ligament towards the round ligament. This is done with the patient in steep 45 degree Trendelenburg. Each of the tables is equipped with a shoulder bolster that keeps the patient from falling in a cephalad uh, direction down towards the uh, patient, towards the uh, anesthesiologist. Here you can see we've encountered a little bit of bleeding, likely due to the tension we're keeping on the tissue, and so we simply reapply the bipolar cautery multiple times. We know this is safe in this location this is not a problem and then we'll continue to work our way over towards the round ligament the preference is to incise the round ligament at least a centimeter away from the uterus that's because there are many ascending uterine arteries that are immediately beneath the juncture of the round ligament and the uterus we keep the uterus on easy tension and we keep all of the side of the uterus that we're operating on in direct visualization. We also pay close attention to back bleeding because when you're working particularly on a massive uterus in you're working in one corner of the right side you can have profuse bleeding from the left side. Now here you can see we just push the uterus up since we've transected the round ligament and look at how we are right at the cervix with the round ligament. So with the uterus on tension, when you push it up, the round ligament is suddenly displaced to near the cervix. So we identify the glistening white cervicovaginal anterior fascia by, by pushing rather roughly on the anterior cervix and lifting with our suprapubic port. And I will add here, many of our colleagues and students from our LIGO course have gone home having learned these techniques but tried to use them employing only three ports. Not such a good idea. 
The surgeon needs two hands. Here you can see we're feeling the posterior cervical vaginal margin. Now I'm feeling the anterior cervical vaginal margin and I'm going to feed the uterine arteries into my ligature. Not such a good bite to start out with, but it's a start. So what I'll do is, having coagulated that, I will take a bigger bite and I'll take sequentially bigger bites until I feel like I have encompassed the uterine artery. And so maybe it will come to find us. Sometimes what you can do is dive the anterior blade of the ligature device behind the uterine artery there, as you can see, into the cardinal ligament and grasp a bigger and better bite of the uterine artery. So here I am going to try and dive the anterior blade in. I am going to rotate the cervix a little bit so that I can get a nicer grasp. So now I'm moving the uterus so that it's more favorable to me. Small amount of bleeding has developed, not a problem. So what we will do then is come in with the ligature. And now with the ligature we will get hemostasis. You can see the arteries just a little below where I was. And it's good to see that this is not such a clean, perfect case. You can see how we handle the average case. I've done about 12 or 15 cases now with what even the anesthesiologist would say was zero blood loss. But most cases I report about 25 to 50 cc's. This case looks like it might be a 50 cc case. So finally we have a little hemostasis, but we're reapplying and reapplying the ligature at the level of the mid cervix, so it's certainly safe to do what we're doing. Now we can incise through the uterine artery and you can see the glistening white cervical fascia below and we're going below the pubocervical fascia over the anterior cervix. Incising the cardinal ligament fibers we're going to use the blades of the ligature feeling the cervix, feeling the butt of the cervix now and getting the posterior cardinal ligament fibers and coagulating and incising through those only to expand more of the fibers of the cardinal ligament. So these are cut through very slowly and gradually and hemostatically. Now we can push the uterine artery down exposing more of the pubocervical fascia and then incise through in a very hemostatic fashion and we'll keep the posterior blade under the pubocervical fascia and just keep incising through. We'll feel the anterior cervix. We're a little high actually right in this location. We're pushing up on the uterus constantly and now I'm going to push the pubocervical fascia off of the cervix. You can see that it is sticking there so I'll go and get the uterus sacral ligament complex now not a very big bite if I do add in retrospect but I'm nicely high on the cervix here I'm going to scoot under some more of the uterosacral ligaments so that I can insert my blade into the exact location of the cervicovaginal margin and I'm doing it here now so I'm essentially sculpting the cervix away from the vagina so now I'm palpating again. I'm going to go and use my blade to dive posteriorly. And here you can see very gradually we're kind of approximating the uterosacral ligament. I'm going to dive the blade in there now to actually coagulate the uterosacral ligament. And this didn't cut so well, so here we are applying it again because I'd really like to see the uterosacral ligaments drop away. Now we're going to use monopolar to incise into the vagina. The uh, precise cervicovaginal margin is delineated. I'm, we're palpating the cervical stroma 
And then we are palpating the, tweaking the Humi uterine manipulator. And I'm going to use the back of the triverse monopolar coagulator to hemostatically incise into the vagina. As soon as we incise into the vagina per se, we'll see a rapid loss of our pneumoperitoneum. And at that point then, what we'll need to do is replace the Humi uterine manipulator with the uh, glove and we'll use our SEM forceps to hold the uterus. So very carefully now we've incised in, you can see a fleck of the green Kroner uterine manipulator and we're able to continue for a little while incising the, the vaginal edge. With the Kroner manipulator still in place, the cervix is grasped with a SEM biopsy forcep and elevated and the triverse monopolar incises through the cervicovaginal margin continuing to precisely delineate the margin of the cervix so that the vagina is not shortened. We prefer the hook over the spatula simply because it is easier to incise through the cervicovaginal margin and it goes very hemostatically. We continue as long as the air or pneumoperitoneum persists in the abdomen. We work as far as we can in a hemostatic and careful fashion. By now, however, we are losing our pneumoperitoneum, so we simply remove the kroner and using two sembiopsy forceps, we're exposing the anterior vagina. And this is the right side of the cervix and with the monopolar we will begin incising across the cervix. You can see the os of the cervix right there. That's the os. And we're confirming that we're at the precise cervicovaginal margin. So now we will begin after confirming that to incise across the right side of the vagina and the posterior vaginal wall. Notice that the triverse or with the valley lab mode is very hemostatic. It enables us to incise using simply an arc of the current to jump from the uh, electrode to the tissue and it does so in a precisely hemostatic fashion. Here we're transecting some of the right uterosacral ligament and this is the right posterior vaginal wall. Typically what we do is advance the SEM biopsy forceps immediately adjacent to the tissue that we are transecting. So now I'll identify more of the uterosacral ligament right there and we will transect some more of the uterosacral and then this will facilitate completion of the removal of the uterus. The triverse valley lab mode is not a blend of cut and coag but it is a separate wavelength created specifically for cutting in a coagulative fashion. And you use a pencil-like device laparoscopically. So here we will continue again identifying the precise cervicovaginal margin and showing the surgeon exactly the uh, anatomy of the uterosacral ligament. And this is a very safe and obviously anatomic dissection here. It's easy to remedy any confusion of the anatomy by simply re-identifying the landmarks that we're all so familiar with. Here the posterior vaginal wall simply splits very nicely and we're able to, with the heel of the triverse on valley lab mode, obtain nice hemostasis.
continuing and moving the sem biopsy forceps again closer to the tissue that's to be cut we're able to identify the posterior vaginal wall and continue incising across the vagina now the least efficient use of the triverse makes the most smoke the most efficient arcing in this way makes the least smoke and you can see that we are precisely on the cervicovaginal margin and we're about to complete the transection but we're not editing out any critical step in this hysterectomy originally this hysterectomy took about 48 minutes to perform and what you can see now is that as we are thinning out some of the final fibers of the transection of the cervix now we've freed out off the cervix precisely from the vagina now we pass a tenaculum up the vagina and grasp the cervix under direct visualization and begin to pull out the uterus we reach in and uh, having lost it we will reach in with the tenaculum again but only under direct visualization grasp the cervix and remove the uterus tubes and ovaries through the vagina with no bleeding from the vaginal cuff we can then attend to removing the appendix so the appendix is then grasped the meso appendix is nicely identified along its length to confirm the site of its attachment to the rest of the cecum and to identify the window of its attachment which can be identified in the mid-level of the screen and this is the site of the uh, a clear window which you can now see being poked at so the ligature device will aim precisely for that window using the ligature still with three uh, bars on the ligature needed we quickly are able to dissect along the meso appendix I offer appendectomy to every single patient having a hysterectomy in our series in which we uh, reported uh, a 297 patients having uh, total laparoscopic hysterectomy with an appendectomy we found pathology among 5% of patients and we found a carcinoid tumor of the ovary among 1% specifically among those uh, three patients with the carcinoid tumor two patients had to have a staging ilio ascending colectomy which typically and this has been reported in other series from the general surgery groups uh, did not contain any metastases but it was necessary to be done for staging these patients would have died of intra-abdominal carcinoid tumor had the incidental appendectomy not been done now using a zero vicral uh, endo loop which is a pre-tied lasso on a disposable pushing to, uh, pusher the appendix is effectively lassoed and then strictured at the base very carefully the uh, zero vicral single stricture is all we use we do not bury it we do not use two applications this whole appendectomy as you have just visualized takes about three minutes unfortunately we often don't get paid for it because it's a preventive treatment and not a an indicated treatment addressing an existing problem using the ligature we simply cut the uh, zero vicral suture after confirming that we have hemostasis a ring forcep is then passed up the vagina uh, to uh, around the side of the uh, glove containing the four by fours and this is used to pull the appendix out we've had a zero 
incidence of infections in our reported series. However, in one patient who weighed 344 pounds, whose appendectomy was performed after that series, uh, there is one infection that we now could attribute to the performance of the appendectomy. Now using a zero vicral JK10 suture on an ST3 needle, which is straight, we pick up the uterosacral ligament and the vagina and pass this suture through, grasping it rather promptly before it changes its orientation. Still using the SEM biopsy forcep, we pass the suture mostly by just rotating it towards the umbilicus, to point, point towards the umbilicus. Grasping it again. And this suture must be passed as a figure of N. It cannot be placed as a figure of 8. In other words, these two stitches that you see being placed are placed in a parallel fashion. They do not cross over each other. And that's to allow for tying to be done because the suture must be able to be pulled through the skin. So here you can see we've passed two passes of the suture. We'll grasp the suture vicral itself and pull it through the tissue. And since it's not crossing over itself, you can see the uterosacral ligament is nicely in, uh, in, encompassed in this suture. And then the JK10, two figure of eights are tied outside of the body, which I'm doing right now during this period that's not being viewed and then the two square knots are pushed together into the tissue and tied. It's tied very tightly and then it's taken off of slip mode. A third knot is being tied outside the body and the pusher device is now being used to push the third suture and taking it off of slip mode. And then after a fourth knot has been applied which it was off of this video, it is simply cut with the ligature device. Now, minor hemostasis problems with the vaginal cuff will be addressed during the closure. The uh, second suture will close the middle of the vagina and will obtain hemostasis on that side. So with the SEM, I always grasp the distal aspect of the uh, needle. And then with the needle driver, I go very close to the previous stitch and turn it, again, with a rotating motion pointing towards the umbilicus. And I'm able to pick up the tip of that needle with the SEM biopsy forceps and not include any tissue in the some forceps as I pull it out. I'm going to re-grasp and then this will close the middle of the vagina passing this rather easily through and rotating towards the umbilicus making sure that I have passed it through not just the peritoneal surface but also the squamous mucosa of the vagina and then I'll simply lift and expose the squamous mucosa of the anterior vagina still using that rotation towards the umbilicus and then having passed again a figure of N I'll pull the suture through the vagina all the way out at this time I'm passing two square knots and then I am dropping the loose end and tightening the lasso into the tissue and then taking it off of slip mode by pulling in two separate directions. And then I'll proceed to pass two more square uh, knots of the zero vicral, tightening it up and taking it off of slip mode. And then a fourth square knot and you can see it being passed this time. It's not edited out. And that gives us hemostasis on this side. You can see the good support on the left side as evidenced by a, uh, some tenting of the left uterosacral ligament. Now we'll proceed to put in the final suture on the right apex. And you can see that my use of this suture, the JK10 made by Ethicon, 
is is highly repetitive. In other words, I use the same style every time. So now I'm identifying the vaginal mucosa. I am identifying the uterosacral ligament and I am suturing them to each other. One of the main reasons why laparoscopic hysterectomies and, and indeed abdominal hysterectomies may offer better support to Paris patients is that we are able to see the uterosacral ligament and see the intra-abdominal support that we provide in a way that's far better than most vaginal surgeons. So in specifically identifying the uterosacral ligament very nicely, we're able to incorporate it and to suspend the vagina on the very same ligaments that have, continue, that have held the cervix up in such a reliable fashion. And again, you can see here, this is the mechanism of a figure of N. You can actually see the spiral structure of this stitch. As we pull it through, we place, again to reiterate, two square knots on the zero vicral. We drop the loose end and just advance the lasso on the knot pusher until it's quite tight, until it's very tight taking it off of slip mode and then passing a second single first half of a square knot and tightening it in two separate directions and then finally the fourth square uh, half fourth knot the second half of the square knot and that's tightened and taken off of slip mode and then it's cut. And typically the, the most success using the ligature for cutting is to put it all the way into the jaw like this and to advance it. It wasn't made to do that, but we enjoy it for, with that purpose. Now we're looking at the degree of support we've offered and it's good. There's a little uh, hemostasis that we have just uh, treated with the triverse. So now we're going to be uh, placing the suture that I like to place because I like to reperitonealize over this raw vaginal apex. So what we will do is uh, pick up the bladder flap first because we're going to be pulling that down over the raw vaginal apex. And we're just going to place a large circular stitch using this zero vicral uh, through the vagina picking up first the posterior wall uh, will come through uh, but the purpose of this stitch is simply to prevent small bowel from adhering to the vaginal apex in this series of nearly a thousand patients of mine undergoing TLH uh, we have had exactly three patients have a small bowel obstruction diagnosed by CAT scan after the surgery uh, after waiting for the ileus to resolve and uh, the CAT scan shows a uh, focal obstruction of the bowel at the region of the vaginal apex normal white count no fever but just persistent ileus and no appetite and occasional vomiting so in order to prevent that I like to reperitonealize using a stitch like this that incorporates the bladder flap now with this suture you can see that we're using absorbable vicral. Um, in cases for patients uh, who continue to have prolapse and the uterosacral ligament is not as nicely taut as you see in this case, we will actually use uh, a zero ethabon suture and that will plicate the uterosacral ligament. So we'll pass the ethabon suture directly through the tented uterosacral ligaments and we will pick up the bladder flap exactly like this so that the bladder flap covers the raw vaginal apex and is not susceptible to uh, infections such as what you, um, I'm sorry, is not susceptible to adhesions such as uh, what we've described. Now when you see tenting of the uterosacral ligaments, as in this case, this kind of uh, plication of the uterosacral ligaments in the midline is not necessary. Um, but when the, there's less tenting than this and more laxity, it's a very good idea. 
to use a permanent ethabon suture, and you cannot go through the vaginal mucosa with that. In cases in which there's even more uh, capacity of the vaginal mucosa, we have excised a triangle-shaped uh, redundancy of the vaginal wall and then sutured that in a midline fashion and then plicated the uterosacral ligaments. Complications from this procedure total 4.7% with 1% urologic, hemorrhagic, and wound healing problems comprising the bulk. Over time in this learning curve of 954 cases, the blood loss has averaged 129 cc's with a range of 0 in 12 of them up to 1200 cc's. The duration of surgeries decreased dramatically over time, with some cases being done in about 34 minutes. But with more experience, what you can see in the latter half, that there are many cases that are done in under an hour. Uh, and this includes node dissections in many. The duration of hospital stay is typically one day for most patients and has been decreasing. And then finally, the uterine weight seems to not be increasing but if you look at the kilo club you see many more members of the kilo club 1000 grams in the last half of this series of 954 cases so to conclude it takes maybe 30 minutes longer than an open procedure but the patients go home the next day the blood loss is dramatically less this can be done on a nulligravid woman Obese women up to body mass 71 have been performed. It's safe on senior women and also good for massive uteruses. Total laparoscopic hysterectomy. It's safe and now is the time. Thank you.